Over the years, it became clear that DES and triple DES are simply not designed for modern hardware and are too slow. As a result, NIST started a new process to standardize in a new block cipher called the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES for short. NIST started this effort in 1997 when it requested uh, proposals for a new block cipher. It received 15 submissions a year later. And finally, in the year 2000, it adopted the cipher called Rindel as the advanced encryption standard. This was a cipher designed in Belgium. And we already said that its block size is 128 bits. And it's got three possible key sizes, 128 bits, 192 bits, and 256. And now the assumption is that the larger the key size is, the more secure the block cipher is as a pseudo-random permutation. But because it also has more rounds involved in its operation, the slower the cipher becomes. So the larger the key, supposedly the more secure the cipher, but also the slower it becomes. So for example, AES-128 is the fastest of these uh, ciphers, and AES-256 is the slowest. Now, AES is built as what's called a substitution permutation network. It's not a Feistel network. Remember that in a Feistel network, half the bits were unchanged from round to round. In a substitution permutation network, all the bits are changed in every round. And the network works as follows. So here we have the first round of the substitution permutation network, where the first thing we do is we XOR the current state with the round key, in this case, the first round key. Then we go through a substitution layer where blocks of state are replaced with other blocks based on what the substitution table says. And then we go through a permutation layer where bits are permuted and shuffled around. And then we do this again. We XOR with the next round key. We go through a substitution phase and we permute the bits around. And so on and so on and so forth until we reach the final round where we XOR with the very last round key and then out comes the output. Now, an important point about this design is that, in fact, because of how it's built, every step in this network needs to be reversible so that the whole thing is reversible. And so the way we would uh, decrypt, essentially, is we would take the output and simply apply each step of the network in reverse order. So we start with the permutation step, and we have to make sure that step is reversible. Then we look at the substitution layer, and we have to make sure this step is reversible. And this is very different from DES. In DES, if you remember, the substitution tables were not reversible at all. In fact, they mapped six bits to four bits, whereas here, everything has to be reversible. Otherwise, it would be impossible to decrypt. And of course, the XOR with the round key uh, is reversible as well. OK, so inversion of a substitution permutation network is simply done by applying all the steps in the reverse order. So now that we understand the generic construction, let's look at the specifics of AES. So AES operates on a 128-bit block, which is 16 bytes. So what we do with AES is we uh, write those 16 bytes as a 4 by 4 matrix. Each cell in the matrix contains one byte. And then we start with the first round. So we XOR with the first round key. And then we apply a certain function that uh, includes substitutions and permutations and other operations on the state. And again, these three functions that are applied here have to be invertible so that, in fact, the cipher can be decrypted. And then we XOR with the next round key. And we do that again. Again, we apply the round function and XOR with the round key. And we do that again and again and again. We do it 10 times, although interestingly, in the last round, the mixed column step is actually missing. And then finally, we XOR with the last round key, and uh, out comes the output. Again, at every phase here, we always, always, always keep this 4x4 four four array. And so the output is also 4x4, four four, which is 16 bytes, which is 128 bits. Now, the round keys themselves, of course, come from a 16-byte AES key uh, using key expansion. So the key expansion maps us from a 16-byte AES key into 11 keys each one being 16 bytes. So these keys themselves are also a 4x4 four four array that's XORed into the current state. OK, so that's the schematic of how AES works. And the only thing that's left to do is specify these three functions, byte sub, shift row, and mix column. And those are fairly easy to explain. So I'm just going to give you the high level description of what they are. And uh, those interested in the details can look it up online. So the way byte substitution works is literally it's one S box containing 256 bytes. And essentially what it does is it uh, applies the S box to every byte in the current state. So let me explain what I mean by that. So the current state is going to be this 4x4 four four, uh, table. So here we have the 4x4 four four 
table. And to each element in this table, we apply the S box. So let's call it the A table. And then what we do is essentially for all four by four entries, essentially the next step, A, I, J, becomes the current step evaluated at the lookup table. So we use the current cell as an entry, as an index into the lookup table, and then uh, the value of the lookup table is what's output. Okay, so that's the first step. The next step that happens is a shift row step, which is basically just a permutation. So essentially, we kind of do a cyclic shift on each one of the rows. So you can see the second row is cyclically shifted by one position. The third row is cyclically shifted by two positions. And the third row is cyclically shifted by three positions. And the last thing we do is mix columns, where literally we apply a linear transformation to each one of these columns. So there's a certain matrix that multiplies each one of these columns, and it becomes uh, the next column. So this linear transformation is applied independently to each one of the columns. Now I should point out that so far, uh, shift rows and mixed columns are very easy to implement in code. And I should say that the by substitution itself is also easily computable, so that you can actually write code that takes less than 256 bytes to write. And you can kind of shrink the description of AES by literally storing code that computes the table rather than hardwiring the table into your implementation. And in fact, this is kind of a generic fact about AES that if you kind of allow no pre-computation at all, including computing the S box on the fly, then in fact you get a fairly small implementation of AES. So it, it could fit on very constrained environments where there isn't enough room to hold uh, complicated code. But of course, this would be the slowest implementation because everything is computed now on the fly. And as a result, the implementation obviously is going to be uh, slower than uh, if things were pre-computed. And then there's this trade-off. For example, if you have a lot of space and you can support large code, you can actually pre-compute quite a bit of the three steps that I just mentioned. In fact, there are multiple options of pre-computations. You can build a table that's only 4 kilobyte big. Or you can build a table that's even longer, maybe 24 kilobytes. So basically, you'll have these big tables in your implementation, but then your actual performance is going to be really good because all you're doing is just table lookups and XORs. You're not doing any other complicated arithmetic. And as a result, if you can do a lot of pre-computation, these three steps here, byte sub, shift rows, and mixed columns, can be converted just into a number, a small number of table lookups and some XORs. All you can do is just compute the S box. So now your implementation would just have 256 bytes hard-coded. The rest would just be code that's actually computing these three functions. The performance would be slower than in the previous step, but the code footprint would also be smaller. So and overall, there's this nice trade-off between code size and performance. So on high-end machines, on high-end servers, where you can afford to have a lot of code, you can pre-compute and store these big tables and get the best performance. Whereas on low-end machines like 8-bit smart cards or think of like an 8-bit wristwatch, you would actually have a relatively small implementation of AES, uh, but as a result, of course, it won't be so fast. So here's an example that's a little unusual. Suppose you wanted to implement AES in JavaScript so you can send an AES library to the browser and have the browser actually do AES by itself. So in this case, what you'd like to do is you'd like to both shrink the code size so that on the network, there's minimum traffic to send the library over to the browser. But at the same time, you'd like the browser performance to be as fast as possible. Uh, so this is something that uh, we did a while ago. Essentially, the idea is that the code that actually gets sent to the browser doesn't have any pre-computed table. And as a result, it's fairly small code. But then the minute it lands on the browser, what the browser will do is it will actually pre-compute all the tables. So in some sense, the code goes from this being small and compact it gets bloated with all these pre-computed tables, but those are stored on the laptop, which presumably